Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, he being Jesus, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. The healing of Bartimaeus. This story is the last healing story for the Gospel of Mark. This story proceeds immediately the parade into Jerusalem with the, flat, or the palms waving and the shouts of Hosanna. This story is the last story in Jesus' kind of typical ministry from here on out. Jesus is on his way to the cross. The story is also the final story of a significant section of the Gospel of Mark that we have been learning from in the last couple of months. Since the beginning of September, we have been in this kind of middle section of the second half of the Gospel of Mark. Three chapters where Jesus is spending his time really teaching his disciples. The first eight chapters of the Gospel of of Mark, Jesus is out there, he's traveling around Galilee, he's in the Jewish, Jewish regions, he's going into the Gentile regions, and he's, and he's displaying the great, awesome power of God. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking in the first eight chapters, he just does these miraculous things. And in the course of those first two or so years of Jesus' ministry, it's his actions that are calling people to him. He's healing people. He's exercising demons. He's feeding the hungry. First 5,000 and then 4,000. And people are flocking from all over Israel because he is displaying the great deeds of God's power. But we get to chapter 8, and Jesus stops doing and he starts teaching. It's like he's given his followers the object lesson, right? See, you've been experienced God's love, but here's where the rubber meets the road. If you're going to be my follower, I need to teach you what that means. And so for the past two months, we have found ourselves in that part, the teaching, the special instruction that Jesus is giving his disciples during those last months of his ministry. It's interesting because the healing of blind Bartimaeus is the final story of this section that we've been with. The first story of that section was the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. Do you remember that story, Bethsaida? <coughs> Jesus is there and friends bring their blind friend and they beg. Please restore his sight. And so he takes the blind man and he leaves the village. He takes him out into the country. And he spits on his hands. We, we kind of squirm at that, don't we? He spits on his hands and he touches the man's eyes. And he says, what do you see? And the man says, well, I see people walking around, but they look like trees. <laughs> and I guess Jesus had to do it again. And he put his eye, hands back on the blind man's eyes. Now, what do you see? His sight had been restored. And there is a reason why Mark begins and ends this section 
of his gospel with the healing of the blind. The people who don't have the physical ability to see can see things that his disciples and his followers tend to miss. It's about blindness and sight, as Jan mentioned in her call to worship. It's an important section of the gospel where the rubber meets the road. Jesus is telling them, what does it really mean to be the Messiah? See, his followers, his disciples expected this great military leader to come in on, their, on his war horse and deliver Israel from the domination of Rome. They were yearning for another King David. But Jesus said, no, I'm a suffering Messiah. And three times he says to his disciples, he says, I will be betrayed, I will be tried, I will be executed, I will die and be laid in a grave, and three days later I will rise again into life. And three times his disciples just don't get it. And then he says, so what does it mean to be a follower of me? What does it really mean to be a follower of me? And Jesus is clear. We have been learning this in the past weeks. He says, you must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you must lose it. You must welcome the least of these into your midst. You must welcome the children. And when you welcome one such child, you welcome me and the one who sent me. You will remember that your treasure is not found here on earth, but it is found in the heaven. That's what he said to the rich man. And he said, in this, in God's kingdom, the last will be first, and the first will be last. See, Jesus has been teaching his disciples for the past couple of months. He's been saying, my kingdom is not like any other kingdom you have ever seen. God's kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom, the last, will be first. God's kingdom, we will be servants to all. So here we are, we're meeting Jesus coming into Jericho and out of Jericho, and he is at the beginning of his parade. He is gathering his followers, they are going with him to Jerusalem. And they're excited, and I can imagine they're boisterous, they know that something is happening, and in theory you think their hearts would be full of this teaching that he has been spending so much time with. The least. The special place in God's heart for the poor and the marginalized. And they're focused on being his followers. They're heading towards Jerusalem. They know something big is coming. And there is Bartimaeus on the side of the road. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And these are the followers who have been spending this time with Jesus, hearing, what does it mean to be my follower? What does it mean to be my disciple? These are the people whose hearts are supposed to be filled with his teaching. What do they do? Did you hear? They scolded him. They tried to silence him. They're too focused on following Jesus. <laughs> We've got a place to go. People to see. Our teacher's up ahead. Shh. You're distracting us. But Bartimaeus, he won't be silenced, will he? He only shouts louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on So it would be easy for me to preach a sermon, and I confess I have preached this sermon. 
about those silly disciples who just never got it. Those silly disciples who were so dense that they had Jesus right there in the midst, teaching them right in front of them. And still they schooled in their Bartimaeus. But I don't know. This week I have been haunted by his voice. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I have been haunted by this least of days on the side of the road. And I confess that I have been convicted by this text. I find myself more often than not focused on following Jesus. Shh, shh, you over here. I'm following you. I find myself too often trying to silence those on the margins. I do it here in worship. Trying to keep the voices down. Silence. Now, this is not just something that the disciples struggle with. I think we all get focused on the following. We miss the teaching. Something big is about to happen in the next few days, isn't it? And I don't mean the fourth game of the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> All the lines over there rolled their eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but in just over a week, we have a big election. And people are feeling anxious and hopeful. People are feeling tense. And there's all sorts of commentary swirling around us. It's everywhere, isn't it? We had our third of three presidential debates on Tuesday. And it was on foreign policy. And President Obama debated Governor Romney about foreign policy. And there was a, there's so many different analyses swirling around this debate. It's too hard to try to figure it all out. And none of it is unbiased. Right? But there was one thought, a stream of thought that was happening around that debate. And several people on both sides of the issue were talking about how Governor Romney was so agreeable with President Obama when it came to foreign policy. I remember I watched uh, The Daily Show and Jon Stewart said, I think Governor Romney is leaning Obama because he was so agreeable to the foreign policy. Well, there was another comment, and you're not imagining your pastor did just pick up her smartphone in the middle of her sermon. I'm going to read a tweet. You don't print tweets out. <laughs> you use electronic devices to read tweets. And I never, in the 13 years of pastoring, imagined that I would quote this person in worship. Uh -oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Ann Coulter had a tweet on Tuesday night. And she was doing this. She was talking about Governor Romney agreeing with Barack Obama, President Obama. And I'm going to read her tweet. Um, and it pains me to do so because the language is harsh. But I'm going to quote her directly. Ann Coulter says, I highly approve of Romney's decision to be kind and gentle to the retard. Oh. Did y'all hear that? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so wrong on so many different levels, isn't it? Yes. You, all of your reactions were the same reaction I had when I heard about this. Now she's that's how she makes her money, right? <laughs> she is she does this to get a reaction. And she has done send out so many offensive things about President Obama, most of which are laced or with racism. So I'm not surprised that this came out of her brain. But 
But something really got me about this particular tweet. Something really got me. And you know what? After reflecting on this for a while, I realized what got me. It was the modern day Bartimaeus who was on the side of the road that said, have mercy on me. See, we're so focused on November 6th, right, that this kind of um, bigotry almost goes unnoticed. We are focused on what's going to happen in nine days that we didn't even hear those words come directly out of Ann Coulter's mouth. We heard it come out of Bartimaeus's mouth, who said from the side of the road, have mercy on me. See, I was too busy following something big's happening to hear the bigotry. <coughs> but we had a Bartimaeus who came and rose up and spoke truth. And that's what I want to close with. <coughs> on the front of your order of worship, you see John Franklin Stevens, and I invite you actually to look at his face, because these are his words. Dear Ann Coulter, come on, Mrs. Coulter, you aren't dumb and you aren't shallow. So why are you continually using a word like the R word as an insult? I'm a 30-year-old man with Down syndrome who has struggled with the public's perception that an intellectual disability means that I am dumb and shallow. I am not either of those things, but I do process information more slowly than the rest of you. In fact, it has taken me all day to figure out how to respond to your use of the R word last night. I thought first of asking whether you meant to describe the president as someone who was bullied as a child by people like you, but who rose above it to find a way to succeed in life as so many of my fellow Special Olympians have. Then I wondered if you meant to describe him as someone who has to struggle to be thoughtful about everything he says as everyone else races from one snarky soundbite to the next. Finally, I wondered if you meant to degrade him as someone who is likely to receive bad health care, live in low-grade housing with very little income, and yet still manages to see life as a wonderful gift. Because, Ms. Coulter, that is who we are and much, much more. After I saw your tweet, I realized you just wanted to belittle the president by linking him to people like me. You assumed that people would understand and accept that being linked to somebody like me is an insult, and you assumed you could get away with it and still appear on TV. I have to wonder if you considered other hateful words, but recoiled from the backlash. Here's the truth. Mrs. Coulter, you and society need to learn that being compared to people like me should be considered a badge of honor. Amen. No one overcomes more than we do and still loves so much. So join us Sunday at the Special Olympics See if you can walk away with your heart unchanged. A friend you haven't met yet. John Franklin Stevens, Global Messenger, Special Olympics, Virginia. Mr. Stevens is our Bartimaeus. As we got caught into going forward towards November 6th, his voice have mercy on me. So I close with a prayer. I 
ask for forgiveness for the times when I got too busy following Jesus to hear and live his teaching. I ask for strength to do things differently in the future. And I give thanks to our God for those beautiful people in our world who are brave enough to shout over the noise of the crowd. They are the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and for that good news. Thanks be to God.